Hi everyone, I'm Ben Murray. I'm Chris Armstrong. And we're lecturers here at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Hull. So welcome to our undergraduate chemistry labs. Um, so the purpose of these videos that we're shooting and um, that you are, you are watching now is to essentially give you a taste of what it is like to be a you know, student at the University of Hull studying on one of our chemistry programmes. So we're going to show you the equipment that we have and some of the experiments that you will perform as an undergraduate student here. <laughs> So, analytical chemistry is all about looking at things that we make and trying to be a bit quantitative about it. So what we've got here, we've got auto samplers, so we can run dozens or even hundreds of samples all at the same time in automated. Uh, HPLC standing for High Performance Liquid Chromatography. We've got our technical staff, we keep it all running. Don't, don't make them angry lots of analytical equipment that just try to separate things. So you get complicated mixtures of materials and we want to separate that. So you've probably at home or at school done that chromatography experiment with tracing paper or filter paper, you're separating just the exact same stuff but we can do it with columns and more complicated liquids. And over here where it gets really loud we can actually do it with gases, with gas chromatography right here major analytical switch. Yeah, so one thing we should point out is that the pool is really quite strong in analytical chemistry. We have all of this equipment which our students use in a hands-on manner so you will get excellent training here in all aspects of analytical uh, chromatography and analysis. Should we head back to yeah. Going to another one of our open bench spaces uh, that we can set most things up on. There's lots of spectrometers over here. Basically, with any part of the electromagnetic spectrum we can scan through in the teaching rooms. So we've got a teaching set up. One of the interesting things is we've actually got computers all set up in here as well, so you can log on. And instead of just writing and scribbling down all your results, you can pack them straight into a computer and do your writing up here as well, and access calculators, programs, extra software, all while you're doing the experiment. Teaching labs? Inorganic. Okay, let's go. Inorganic teaching labs. Upstairs, past all the lockers that students can get. So you can store laptops, books, notes, all sorts of things in there. Alright, so these are the inorganic teaching labs here. Um, synthesis is a really important part of a chemistry degree and what we do here is we give students the opportunity to perform a wide range of different experiments that back up the theory that you will learn about in lectures. So what you can see here is we have a series of benches and fume hoods. This means that each student gets to perform their own experiment and then essentially has their own dedicated fume hood space. So this is something that you may not have had um, in A level or in college but here you get to perform all the experiments in a hands-on manner and you get to use the most modern equipment um, to be able to do so. Banks of European vapors are here. These allow us to remove solvents from the action vessels. I don't walk in here, so I'm working here, so I've no idea where everything is. I'm more downstairs. But I think Ben lives here. And then here is our analytical balance room. And also, quickly, where we can record the magnetic susceptibility of the inorganic compound you will synthesize ah. in the year two and year three labs. Well, upstairs we have an identical lab almost, but that's dedicated to organic chemistry practical experiments. Oh well, that puts an end to that one.
So another purification technique that you will learn about during your undergraduate laboratory classes is solid extraction. And this is a technique which separates mixtures of compounds based on their differing solubility in a solvent. So what we do with the solid extraction is we take our mixture of compounds, so this could be an organic compound, an organometallic compound for example, and we place it inside a cellulose thimble. We've got a cellulose thimble, so we'll just pour our mixture of compounds into there. We then place the thimble into the solid apparatus. So this is just a reasonably complex piece of glassware. So pop the thimble into the solid apparatus. Now the Soxit apparatus is then fitted on top of a round bottom flask containing solvent, so we are going to use toluene in this experiment. And on top of the Soxit apparatus we add a useless condenser. So during the Soxit uh, extraction what happens is the solvent is heated, it will then boil, the solvent vapour will travel up the side arm and then cool down at the condenser here. So in the condenser we've got water travelling through it, so that cools down the solvent vapour and it will condense the solvent and um, the solvent will drip back down into this cellulose filter here and the warm solvent will start to accumulate in this little mini reservoir. Once the solvent level reaches this point on the side arm, the solvent will discharge back down into the main body of the flask. Now any compound in the thimble which was soluble in the toluene solvent, which collects in here, will dissolve in the toluene solvent and will ultimately uh, flow back as a solution back into the main body of the flask. Any insoluble material will be left behind in the thimble. So what you can see now is the solvent is boiling, the solvent vapour is travelling up this side arm and it's condensing at the top part of the glassware here where the bottom part of this condenser is. It's a cold day today, so um, the condenser isn't really needed. The toluene is condensing here. So the solvent is condensing, and the liquid is dripping down into this reservoir here, where we have our cellulose thimble containing the mixture of compounds. Now, once the level of the solvent reaches the top of this little side arm here, the solvent will drain back down into the flask at the bottom, taking with it um, the soluble component within the mixture and leaving behind the insoluble Right, so this is an experiment you do in the second year about ligand enhanced luminescence of lanthanides. So lanthanides are the really big metals that you find at the bottom of the periodic table in the F block. And on their own they, they don't do that much. Uh, you have a europium solution here and a, a terbium solution. And what we've also got is a solution of something called pyridine dicarboxylic acid and that nice pyridine group in the middle I'll just quickly draw it out and then some carboxylic acid groups as well and that is going to attach to the metal and change its properties just a little bit so what we're going to see when we mix the two solutions together and expose it to UV light uh, is that it's going to glow a slightly different colour. It's not going to be colourless anymore. It's actually going to go slightly pink in the case of europium. In the case of terbium, it actually glows quite green uh, and a little brighter than the europium. So what we're seeing in both cases here is because the metal itself isn't fluorescing, we're finding that light is being absorbed by the ligand, so all the orbitals and electrons on that ligand are sensitizing the metal indirectly. Then some of that energy gets dumped into the metal and the color that it comes out is determined by the metal itself. So that is where the light that we're seeing glowing is coming from. It comes in from the UV lamp to the metal and then out again as these pink and green colors.